So I try to make uh, my talk easy to follow, and it has this uh, what you would expect by uh, a talk about one single equation. So I will introduce the need for it. I will show you one picture instead of a bunch of formulas for the derivation. And I will talk about its properties uh, from a high level. The only place really where I will go into technical details is for one qubit example. Uh, the take home message of this talk is that this equation uh, is possibly useful both for theorists who want to prove theorems and uh, for experimentalists who want to simulate. In particular, uh, we want to simulate 5 to 15 qubit chips uh, for the purpose of verification of small uh, adiabatic quantum computing devices. And uh, this equation uh, potentially uh, can be used for that uh, because it doesn't incur significant overhead over what's already used. So I would like to point out that uh, when tasked with a task of simulation, most of the people immediately kind of bang their heads on the slow noise problem. Uh, and uh, this problem is really hard, so the equations that we have right now is the non-interacting blip approximation and also the recent work by uh, Smirnov and Amin. And both of those equations are uh, relatively hard to use in any kind of theoretical proofs. Uh, the latest 2018 equation is possibly uh, usable for the numerics, but I haven't really looked at it very carefully yet. Um, so I, on the other hand, decided that I want to first have the, a good equation for the fast noise regime. And uh, it turned out that even for that regime, we didn't actually have the final answer. Because the equation appropriate uh, for the adiabatic quantum computing is called by chemists Redfield equation. And that one is not a completely positive map. There was, however, an ad hoc procedure to produce a completely positive map, a uh, completely positive equation uh, that appeared in the literature before. So what I did is I connected it uh, to the Redfield equation. And I would like to explain why the Redfield is the one that's uh, appropriate. So that it has to do with the ranges of applicability. Uh, this new equation that I'm, I'm presenting in this talk has the name. It's called coarse-grained equation. And daughters called it that because they called the procedure of time averaging coarse-graining. Um, so for both Redfield and the coarse-grained equation, the range of applicability is given just by one condition. Uh, it, the relaxation time of the environment should be much faster than the relaxation time of the system that is induced by the coupling to the environment. Um, for the more familiar to everybody Lindblad equation with Davis generators, there is one extra condition uh, that uh, the level spacing should be bigger than the corresponding relaxation rate of the system. And that condition is uh, crazy to ask for in uh, adiabatic quantum computing because the gap in our system sometimes gets really small. And this, the gaps between excited states get even smaller. So you never can really hope uh, to have that uh, level spacing be always big. So the bath relaxation time here is defined in a liberal way. So I can allow for power law decay in correlation of the bath in time. Uh, but uh, for powers that are relatively big. So 1 over f noise is definitely out of question for my approach. As I said, it is a fast bath approach. Um, I would like to comment that for slow noise, uh, even though we have the equation, the range of applicability of, of this equation is not really clearly spelled out. In words, what they say is that they require a strong diagonal noise. But uh, quantitatively, it's, I'm, it's not really clear, at least to me, what does that mean. Um, so I think of their work uh, with respect to ours is that uh, they kind of branch out into different directions, but they, and the only place where they really overlap is the Davis rates. Now, I have to show you the equation. So uh, we are talking about uh, system and the environment coupled for simplicity through one term that is a tensor product of an operator acting on the system, A, and the operator acting on the environment, B. And there is a correlation function of the environment that's defined. 
uh, the equation looks like a Lindblad equation, only the frequencies on the different sides of density matrix are different. And uh, it also depends, if you look at the rates, these gammas, they depend on one parameter. Uh, this parameter is the time averaging time. Uh, and uh, that hints on the fact that to derive this equation, we needed to time average something. Um, and uh, we don't actually have that much freedom in this parameter. We need to choose it between those two uh, numbers that are required to be well, one much smaller than the other. So it has to be chosen between tau bath and, tau one, uh, and t12. Besides time averaging, there is one other trick that happens during the derivation of this equation. So essentially, you start with a red field equation, you time average, and then you uh, take a look at your rates that you get. And originally, you get this weird trapezoid as the integration domain. So you need to cut the lower part of the trapezoid. And after that, you get a completely positive map. So that's my derivation slide, by the way. Now, uh, I said that it's completely positive. Every completely positive equation can be written in a Lindblad form. So this is the, way, uh, the equivalent form of my uh, equation that is uh, Lindblad. And uh, the generators now are given by those uh, time averaging of the time dependent bath operators uh, with some phase factor. So the interesting thing is that this time dependent bus operator is only taken at times that are in this interval, minus TA over 2 to TA over 2. Uh, we have this result that we, if we start with a local bus operator, then uh, over this time, uh, it only will spread uh, uh, to a finite radius with, by the dynamics of the system. So this radius will be TA over 2 times something called Lee Robinson velocity, which is actually just the norm of the local terms in the system Hamiltonian. This means that the equation in the previous slide is actually locally generated. So we can just take our favorite uh, matrix product state method uh, and then um, do a time step with this equation. Or more specifically, we will write a trajectories formulation of this equation. And then we apply it to the matrix product state, and this will increase the bond dimension only uh, in such a way that truncation will take polynomial time. So I also want to comment on the physical meaning of this equation because it can be a little bit obscure when you just look at the formula. So there are two limits in which Redfield equation is positive. One is that if we time average the hell out of it, is we get Davis generators. And then these rates are only exist on diagonal and are zero everywhere else. Another limit is a little bit more weird. So it's an infinite temperature limit uh, and also flat spectral density kind of limit. So then you get same rate everywhere independent of the omegas. So our equation is uh, somewhat in between. We have this uh, uh, slab of non-zero rates. And outside of them, it looks like uh, everything is zero. Now uh, we are going into more nitty gritty details. So I would like you to uh, learn things in comparison. So I'm going to compare my equation and the work by uh, Smirnov and Amin. Uh, on the case of one qubit. Um, so uh, we have the, uh, the epsilon parameter, which is the longitudinal field that we're going to change. And uh, we, we know the eigenvalues. The B is the bus operator. So we will define, uh, so again, the correlation function of the bus. And uh, so this is a function. There are many numbers that characterize it. Uh, so in particular, one way to characterize it is to Fourier transform it and talk about the spectral density. Another way to characterize it is with tau bath that is defined in this liberal way by an integral relation, so as the smallest number that upper bounds that integral. And the third way to characterize it is with something called noise bandwidth by uh, uh, Smirnov, I mean, and everybody else in that group. Uh, so, and. Uh, it actually, even though it's called bandwidth, it contains the strength of the noise as well. So it's this W thing that's square root of an integral. Now I would like to tell you what is the quantity that I'm actually going to look at. So uh, I'm going to compare uh, tunneling rates, just because Smirnov I mean, uh, specifically talk about tunneling rates in their work, uh, especially their earlier work. 
So, however, they never define what they mean by tunneling rates. So I, I would try to define it rigorously here. So essentially, if we start with a master equation uh, or some other dynamics of the system, and then we uh, actually apply some time averaging to it, possibly, and choose some basis, possibly non-trivial, and then suddenly we see that diagonal of that equation decouples. So then the matrix that appears in that equation will have matrix elements uh, R, J to I, that are actually, by definition, the tunneling rates. If we cannot find this regime, then there is no tunneling rates. So uh, the equation that we have, uh, it has two regimes in which we can define tunneling rates. One is the simple one. Uh, as you know, in the Lindblad equation with Davis generators, or any Lindblad equation for that matter, the diagonal decouples. Uh, sorry, no, no. The specifically the Lindblad equation with Davis generators. Uh, and uh, then you get uh, this Lorentzian shape, and the peak value is smaller than delta, so it's linear in delta. You can think about that. But that's only for rates that are smaller than delta. Now, if uh, our delta is small, if uh, our gap is really small, then uh, this condition doesn't, is not satisfied anymore. So at some point, uh, the Lindblad rates in the eigenbasis are no longer valid. However, uh, in the computational basis, sometimes we can approximate the spectral density as flat, and then we can define the rates again, which are shown as dashed line here. So most of the time, our equation actually cannot be reduced to just the evolution of the diagonal. So it actually describes truly coherent dynamics. Uh, however, there are these two limits. And uh, the re uh, this flat spectral density limit also leads to a Lorentzian line shape, so dashed. I know it's kind of hard to see, but it's also a Lorentzian. Um, and you notice that this dashed and the blue line, uh, they are in different bases. Now, what about the uh, Smirnov amine? So for them, uh, they uh, kind of interpolate between two very well known for a long time limits of the tunneling rates. So they actually, under their assumption, uh, they define uh, a, uh, a kind of evolution of the diagonal for all the steps and until uh, on the interpolation between these two limits. So one limit is the Lindblad, so same Lorentz, and another limit has this strange uh, Gaussian line shape. So I will specifically consider that last limit where the line shape is Gaussian, and I want to compare it with uh, my own uh, kind of uh, Lorentzian line shape. Um, so both of the approaches actually are valid. Uh, so both of these formulas in, in this respect, under their respective assumptions are valid in delta going to zero limit. They are also uh, both can, can be applied in principle to many qubit systems. I just consider one qubit for simplicity. So we see that there is this reorganization energy shift that appears in their approach, but not in ours. Uh, we, we now see that, okay, this Lorentzian actually uh, has some bus dependence in the denominator, and uh, their uh, formula also has some bus dependence in the denominator. Now, specifically, the value at peak uh, is actually slightly different. So both of them have delta squared dependence, but uh, the formulas... Uh, one of them just kind of assumes the flat spectral density, and uh, it, it is what stands in the denominator. In another case, it's this W, uh, the bandwidth of the noise, so-called, that stands in the denominator. So uh, interesting thing that early uh, DeWave experiments on a noisy qubit actually noticed this kind of shifted uh, Gaussian line shape. So I'm curious what is the status right now. Uh, and is uh, have the line shape finally deviated from the Gaussian uh, from for the qubits that we have now. Um, so to conclude, uh, we have these two regimes, and uh, uh, they're different by the line shape and by the finite kind of uh, so by by small details of what stands in the denominator. The numerators, however, are delta squared in both. 
And that's the dependence that was used in a bunch of theoretical work, in, including the one originated from NASA. Um, and uh, I have not had a chance to think about uh, combining the two tricks that were used to derive these equations. So it may be possible. Uh, the references where you can find parts of these results are on the screen. And hopefully, I will publish uh, this work soon. Okay, we have time for one or two questions. So the way you write some of the quantities, for example, W or C of zero, uh, uh, so it, it doesn't make it clear to me how I deal with one over F noise, where these quantities diverge. And uh, uh, so, so in that case, would you? impose some sort of artificial low frequency cutoff. And if you do that, are results independent of that cutoff? Yes. Yeah, so in our case, of course, uh, whenever these quantities appear, and I'm talking about our equation, 1 over an F noise is not allowed just because our equation is not applicable in that regime. In their case, W stands in the denominator. And uh, formally, it is C of 0. So it's just a. Uh, trace of density matrix of the bath times the bath operator squared. So I think that they somehow make it work. I'm not sure if it diverges or not. I have not thought about it. Thank you. Anyone else? We still have a few minutes. Could you explain how you would compute the coarse graining time scale? Oh. Right. So I showed on an earlier slide that it has to be chosen in between uh, of the tau bath and uh, the uh, relaxation rate of the, uh, so the relaxation time of the system, so tau 1 or tau 2. So the actual error estimates, so that show how good is this equation, uh, depends on like how close this uh, time averaging time is to either of those two uh, boundaries. So I would pick it uh, in the middle, as in some kind of geometric mean of those two. Thank you. On the second last slide, um, could you go back there, please? So you show that there's these um, three different methods which, which, which have different ranges of applicability. And there is a method, there is an equation which has applicability in all of those regimes, which is the Feynman-Vernon path integral. And um, I think the reason why master equations were developed and, and used 10, 10 or 15 years ago was because the Feynman-Vernon path integral is too expensive to calculate. But nowadays, if you're doing 5 to 15 qubits, you can actually calculate that path integral. So I wonder what the motivation is for doing uh, master equations. Well, so I guess, uh, yes, in fact, uh, I think non-interacting blib approximation did something along those lines. Uh, so. I think that uh, having an equation often uh, clarifies a lot what is actually going on at every given moment in time in the system. Uh, so, of course, knowing, uh, yeah, so of course, this range of applicability is somewhat smaller than that that can be accessed with a path integral. But at the same time, uh, I think path integral method has its own complications. Uh, so I would uh, definitely prefer to use a master equation just for uh, how easy it is. And also, 
as I mentioned, this, there are two goals here, right? So one is simulating 5 to 15 qubits, but second is possibly attempt some theoretical proofs. So I am not as comfortable proving things uh, that are defined by path integral. I agree. Thank you. With that, let's thank Jenya again.